Let's discuss the structures, names, and properties of ethers in our next section of our lesson. An ether is a compound containing an oxygen atom bonded to two carbon atoms. So if you look at our structure of our simplest ether, here we have an oxygen and attached to it is a methyl group on either side of the oxygen. So here we call it dimethyl ether. Here we have another common ether. Um, again, this is the oxygen atom, and on either side there are two carbon branched chains, so we call that ethyl. So here's diethyl ether. The functional group of an ether is an atom of oxygen bonded to two carbon atoms, and this structure is showing us dimethyl ether and diethyl ether. Although the IUPAC system can be used to name ethers, chemists almost always use common names for these low molecular weight ethers. Common names have been derived by listing the alkyl groups bonded to the oxygen and just listing those in an alphabetical order and then the end of the word becomes ether. So for instance, as in the previous slide, uh, we have an ethyl two carbon chain an ethyl two carbon chain attached to the oxygen in this ether, diethyl ether. Here's the oxygen giving us the ether functional group. On one side we have a six carbon ring. See how we're naming that cyclohexyl. And on this side is a methyl group for the one carbon chain. And just simply in alphabetical order we get cyclohexyl methyl ether. Something important to note is that there are no commas, no dashes between these words. They're just simply separated with a space. Cyclohexyl methyl ether. So again, that will come just from an alphabetical listing of the hydrocarbon chains that are attached to the oxygen. In cyclic ethers, one of the atoms in the ring is oxygen. So these Ethers are known by their common names. Ethylene oxide in this particular structure, ethylene oxide. Uh, this is an important building block for or the organic chemical industry. Coming up in a, a couple sections from now, we'll talk a little bit more about ethylene oxide. And tetrahydrofuran is a very important laboratory and industrial solvent. It's abbreviated THF. So again, there are no um, specific branches coming off the oxygen if it's all attached to the same oxygen in a cyclic structure so we rely on common names you will not need to memorize all, you know just but these two uh, ethylene oxide uh, two carbons attached to the oxygen and here you see a five membered ring but one of the members is the oxygen tetrahydrofuran Ethers are polar compounds in which the oxygen bears a partial negative charge and each attached carbon bears the partial positive charge. So again, looking at um, the structure of an ether reminds us that the oxygen does have this exposed uh, pair of electron sets up at the surface here, giving this region partial negative and pulling on this would be a little partial positive on the carbons. Compare that to this alcohol that we had mentioned in the previous section. And this alcohol, um, you'll notice that it starts to have this hydrogen bonding criteria met. Well, here this is an O and this is an H. Hydrogen bonding that occurs in alcohols is a much stronger intermolecular attraction as to compare to a simple dipole attraction that we would have in an ether compound, especially since if some of these ether compounds get very long carbon chains, then the dispersion forces start to dominate as well. So they, they do not have as strong as intermolecular attractions as the previous discussed alcohols. So if they have a weaker attraction, you'll see that they have a lower boiling point compared to those hydrocarbons of similar molecular weights that do have hydrogen bonding, such as the alcohol groups. So the alcohols have higher boiling points due to the stronger intermolecular H bonding than compared to ethers or even straight chain carbons um, 
Straight chain carbons would only have dispersion forces, whereas ethers have a little dipole attraction here on the oxygen, but very difficult if these hydrocarbon chains start to get increasingly longer and longer. So polar molecules offer weak attractive interactions between molecules and other liquid states. Um, just kind of looking at the density of our polarity in terms of the structure. So ethers are more soluble in water than hydrocarbons um, without any oxygen, but are not nearly as soluble as, as what we were looking in terms of alcohols from the last section. Reactions of ethers, well ethers, ethers are very resistant to chemical reactions. They truly do resemble the hydrocarbons, alkanes, as we were studying earlier. Um, they do not react with oxidizing agents such as our potassium dichromate, remember the K2Cr2O7 from the previous section that could force oxidation. Oxidation is adding oxygen or removing hydrogen. This will not to do that. They don't react with reducing agents such as hydrogen with a transition metal catalyst and they're not affected by most acids or bases with moderate temperatures. So because of their general inertness to chemical reactions, they're very good solvent properties. So ethers tend to be solvents in which we run many organic reactions because they are quite inert. So their most important laboratory and industrial use is that of a solvent to run reactions in. Two of the most common solvents are diethyl ether and tetrahydrofuran from the previous slide. Here's a functional group discussed called the thiols. The functional group that contains an SH, the sulfhydryl group bonded to the tetrahedral carbon atom, shows a Lewis structure as shown here. Notice that the SH, very similar to how we saw OH in the previous lesson for alcohols, but with OHs, those had very strong hydrogen bonds. S to H, the electronegativity difference is not that great and therefore tends to favor a nonpolar region of the molecule. So the functional group CH3SH would be the simplest thiol group. And again, what all we do is say the name of the branch. So this would be methane and we just simply end it with the uh, functional group thiol, methane thiol, CH3SH, which would be the simplest one. The most outstanding property of these low molecular weights is their stench and a rotten egg smell comes to mind or a stink bomb. We actually add uh, methyl thiol into a natural gas because natural gas is uh, odorless and yet if we had a natural gas leak, um, that has a particular odor we associate with it, but it is not from the methane coming out. It's from the additive of a thiol so that we indeed, we indeed, indeed smell the leak of the gas because of this distinct odor of thiol group. The sulfur analog of an alcohol known as the thiol in old literature has a name called mercaptan. So if you're reading along and you ever see this term, mercaptan, literally means mercury seeking or mercury capturing. from the Greek word um, and really what it's allowing us to do is predict that these thiol groups really do indeed grab onto the mercury ions either mercury uh, this is called mercury Roman numeral 1 and this is known as mercury Roman numeral 2 ion and when they do so they form what's called you know a common salt where the mercury attaches on them so just kind of reminding us if we see mercaptan, it's a common name given to the thiol group, not part of IUPAC, but more of a common name that still old chemists will say. 
So in terms of nomenclature, some of the same manner of alcohol naming is used. We simply say the name of that com compound, keeping the final E and adding the suffix thiol. Common names we had mentioned end with mercaptan, and that's just mercury seeking or mercury capturing. The IUPAC name of this compound, ethane thiol, all one word. The IUPAC name here, notice that the carbon attached to the sulfur does indeed get priority over any other substituent group. It would be known as 2-methyl-1-propane thiol, three carbon chain with a methyl group, or isobutyl mercaptan in, is a common name as we hear that. Just kind of thinking through what might be a, you know, another example to just practice naming. Um, suppose we see a compound with a branch here and we're asked to just name it. Top priority carbon is attached to the sulfur. I'm counting five carbons in this chain. So I know that it will be called pentane. And I'll just simply end it with thiol, pentane thiol. Oh, I don't know. Suppose we see something like this. We have a secondary thiol here. Oh, I don't know. I just keep building the branch and we wanted to know what its name might be. Um, so again, just however many carbons are in there, we want a number from the side that creates the smallest number for the functional group. This would be simply called two and then I ended up drawing six carbons. So hexane thiol. And up here, this would be one pentane thiol, indicating the location of the SH group. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> what are some physical properties related to thiols? Some physical properties of thiols. Well, we had mentioned that they are truly considered a nonpolar covalent bond between the S and the H, that their electronegativity difference is not very large, therefore considered nonpolar. So they show very little association by hydrogen bonding, do not meet that criteria. They're typically not involved in any dipole dipole, so the only intermolecular forces going on would be the dispersion factors. Therefore, have extremely low boiling points, very less soluble in water than other polar solvents of similar molecular weights. So a boiling point of methane, methane thiol, boiling point of 6, methanol, you know, equivalent molar mass, all the way up to 65 degrees. And again, that's due to the strong interaction of hydrogen bonding that we find in an alcohol. And we see the trend continue. Reactions of thiols, well thiols are actually weak acids and you can see with the pKa of 10, they're more comparable to phenols which if you remember had an aromatic ring and the OH functional group. A phenol was a weak acid with a pKa of 10. Well these are right in the same range so they're going to follow a lot of similar chemistry as the phenol group. Here is a weak acid such as ethane thiol reacting with a strong base sodium hydroxide. Acid plus base we know makes a salt and water through the process of neutralization. A salt water is produced. The HOH go on to make the water molecule and then, of course, the sodium attaches on, and that's called a salt, sodium ethane thiolate. So the salt water is neutral compared to the acid and the base on the left side. So acids and base do indeed neutralize each other. So thiols do indeed react with strong bases. The most common reaction of thiols in biological systems is their oxidation to disulfides. 
Here is a disulfide bond. Two sulfurs bonded by a single bond and attached to long carbon chains on either side. These thiols are readily oxidized to disulfides by simple molecular oxygen. O2 is molecular oxygen. In fact, they're so susceptible to oxidation that they must be protected from contact with air during their storage. So disulfides in turn are readily reduced to thiols by adding reducing agents. So these are in terms very reversible reactions. Let's read from left to right. Here we have a thiol. Notice the stoichiometry, the coefficient of two. It's telling us we have two identical molecules. Alrighty. This does have an OH on one end as well, but this is the functional group we're looking at. During a process of oxidation, and that simply means removing hydrogen. It also means adding oxygen. But this is the hydrogen that will be removed in the process called oxidation. What happens is that each of those molecules, remember there's two of them, are going to attach sulfur to sulfur and create this disulfide bond. We end up with OH groups on either end when the two sulfurs attach. Now, process of reduction means to add hydrogen. Remember oxidation is to remove hydrogen. We can add the hydrogen back on and separate the two molecules by cleaving this disulfide bond. And these are quite readily reversible. Alrighty. Very important reaction a little bit later in biochemistry when we talk about proteins. Proteins are held together by these disulfide bonds, but we can see that they're readily breakable. We can cleave those bonds through a process of reduction. As you studied the alcohols described in our section, you should pay particular attention to two key points. First, they're almost entirely derived from petroleum, natural gas, or coal. All of these are non-renewable resources. And second, and most important, many of these themselves are starting materials for synthesis of valuable commercial products, without which our modern industrial society wouldn't exist in the way we know it today. Coal, or natural gas called methane, can be oxidized, if I see that in a bracket, to carbon monoxide. Now carbon monoxide in of itself is a poisonous gas, but it's readily reduced, so if I notice this, this means oxidized, and this means reduced. Here is an alcohol group, methanol, sometimes called wood alcohol. Methanol was derived by heating hard woods and limited supply of air, and hence the name wood alcohol. Today, methanol is obtained entirely from the catalytic reduction of carbon monoxide, which is being shown here. Catalytic reduction of carbon monoxide. Now, this methanol, in turn, is the starting material for the preparation of several important industrial and commercial chemicals, including acetic acid, CH3COOH, a carboxylic acid. Acetic acid is the main ingredient, if you will, in vinegar. Another important industrial uh, agent is called formaldehyde. So either the oxidation of methanol to produce formaldehyde or using a catalyst of carbon monoxide will produce acetic acid, two important uh, chemicals in our industry. I'm just looking through the bulk of ethanol produced uh, comes from a worldwide preparation of an acid catalyzed hydration of ethylene. So here is ethylene, or ethene is its IUPAC name, and acid catalyzed. So I can see that we have water and concentrated sulfuric acid. It's derived itself from cracking of the ethane separated from the natural gas. And we can see the product here called ethanol. Ethanol uh, is produced by fermentation of carbohydrates also, like in plant materials, corn, molasses. This is drinking alcohol would be one way to produce ethanol as well. 
the majority of uh, fermentation derived ethanol is used to oxygenate the additives and gasolines uh, so ethanol is typically an additive it can be 85 percent the component of gasoline depending upon the grade of gas that you purchase so again we see um, further sulfuric acid catalytic conversion of the ethanol can create diethyl ether and going on to oxidize eth you know ethylene or ethene here produces this ether group ethene oxide here's the um, sulfuric acid catalyst producing ethylene glycol ethylene glycol of course we mentioned earlier as being the component in radiator fluid other important alcohols can be produced um, starting with propene and again notice this is an alkene group and just kind of summarizing some of the steps here you can go on further read this in your text but we can see two propanol here's our glycerin or glycerol both are common names and some epoxy resins and glues are actually produced from the um, process of adding oxygens onto this propene base over here Glycerin is a byproduct of the manufacturing of soaps by saponification of animal fats and tropical oils. The bulk of glycerin used for our industrial and commercial purposes really is coming from propene as modeled on this slide. Glycerin is, I think, one of the uh, emollients in skin care products, uh, cosmetics, soaps, printing inks, very, very common chemical. This is uh, isopropyl alcohol, kind of used in rubbing alcohol would be its common name. Um, hand lotions, aftershaves, similar cosmetics are the a key component in its use. And then, um, like I said, there's many, many more uses to these alcohols that you can kind of take a look in the last section of your, of your text and just kind of review some of the important industrial uses of each of these categories. And at this point, we'll end our chapter, chapter 14.